Four words determine the direction of the younger son. He came to himself. Tonight, when we open our Bibles to the 15th chapter of the book of Luke, we are introduced in verses 1 and 2 to the real subject matter of this chapter. And as we zero in on the introductory matters concerning this chapter, we see the real audience that is under consideration, the publicans and sinners, as they approach Jesus anticipating hearing him. You would think that would be the greatest of occasions that one could ever imagine. Here are people who want to hear Jesus. That's really what it's all about. But there are some adversaries. The Pharisees and the scribes cast, as it were, an aspersion against Jesus as they look down their noses at these publicans and sinners and use that as an occasion to throw off on Jesus by saying, This man, this man, receiveth sinners and eateth with them. Those last three words are very important because the idea of eating implies fellowship. And thus their accusation is, not only is Jesus here teaching these people, but he's fellowshipping them as though they are okay. And what you have in the rest of the chapter is an answer to that aspersion. And when you look very carefully at Luke 15, 1 and 2, if you mark in your Bible, you might want to underscore sinners. Look at the accentuation on sinners. Now, what do you have in the rest of the chapter? Here we're zeroing in on the matter of sinners. And so tonight, as we think about four words, I want to mention four things. In the first place tonight, I want us to observe prior to coming to himself. What is the situation of this younger son prior to those four words that made a difference in his direction from here on out? When you look very carefully at this young man, you will find that prior to coming to himself, he was asleep in sin. Now, Paul dealt with that very, very carefully in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 6 to 8. When he's writing, really beginning back at chapter 4, verse 13, and going through chapter 5 and verse 11, about the second appearing of our Lord. And he talks about these brethren in Thessalonica and contrasts them with individuals who are not Christians. And when you look at verse 6, the American Standard Translation says, So then let us, look at the us, not sleep, as do the rest. Look at the rest. Now there you have a contrast. But let us watch and be sober, for they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that are drunken are drunken in the night. But let us, since we are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Look at that word, sleep. It's a word here that carries with it and underscores the idea of failure to watch. A failure to be ready for the day of the Lord. I ask you tonight as you read Luke 15, in the condition in which we find this younger son, was he watching for the coming of the Lord? Was he ready for the coming of the Lord? And as far as we know, he's a Jew, isn't he? Under the Torah, one to be accountable unto God as that. Is he ready? Is he watching? The idea in First Thessalonians 5 is spiritual laxity. A worldly apathy to spiritual things, does that describe this young man? 
In fact, when you think about the words of Romans 13, 11, Paul would say, awake out of sleep. Is that what someone needed to say to this younger son? Or in the words of Ephesians 5 and verse 14, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall shine upon thee. But not only that, sleeping in the night is connected with drunkenness. And some have suggested that may very well have been that in which the younger son had engaged. But one writer observed this when he said, The drunkard, steeped in sottish slumber, immersed in the sleep of sin, is Paul's picture of the man off guard and at the mercy of the enemy. Is this younger son at the mercy of the enemy while he is asleep in sin? But then when you get to verses 6 to 8 again, Paul stresses here, Christians who are of the day do not sleep as do the rest, that is, those who are of the night, but watch and are sober in view of the coming of the Lord. Now, when you stress verse 6 and you stress verse 8, you observe the carefulness of those who are of the day. Paul says in verse 6, they stay awake. That word watch is from a word which means to keep awake. And if you study it very carefully, it may very well involve the idea of a determination to stay awake. Have you ever been there? You really want to go to sleep. But you have determined that I cannot do that. I must stay awake. A preacher friend of mine, his wife, were involved in a serious automobile accident many years ago. And when they reeled him into the hospital and began to try to sedate him, his answer was, no, no, don't do that. I have to stay awake and pray for my wife. That's a determination to stay awake. You don't see that in the younger son when it comes to spiritual matters. He's asleep in sin. Now what's the point of the parable? The scribes and the Pharisees. National Israel, John 1.11, He came unto His own things. In my judgment there, that's national Israel. And they that were His own rejected Him, did not receive Him. National Israel is asleep in sin. They have wandered away from their heavenly Father. They are in the pig pen of self-indulgence. John the Immersing One has come on the scene to say, Wake up! You're spiritually asleep. Jesus has come on the scene to say, Wake up! You are spiritually asleep. And in the words of Joel chapter 1 and verse 5, Awake, ye drunkards! God calls out to national Israel one more time in the younger son. And he says to these scribes and Pharisees who epitomize national Israel, the rejecting of the Lord, Jesus dealt with that, you remember, in Matthew 5 and 20, you are asleep in sin. Prior to coming to himself, then, the younger son is asleep in sin. But not only that, in the second place, prior to coming to himself, the younger son is mad because of sin. That's a word, really, that we misuse a lot of times, isn't it? We talk about, I really got mad about that. The idea of mad's out of your head. And maybe that's true about you when you get angry, but the idea of the, of, of the word here is it's an infatuation. It's a craze. And one writer said, when the blinded eyes of the soul are open, no man is content to abide in sin, in destruction. But we are out of our heads when we're in sin. We're mad. And that's the younger son. And this madness caused him... To be blind. In fact, the son had been morally and spiritually blind. 
He had not been able to see things as they were because his sense of values were out of balance. Have you ever been able not to see things as they really are because your sense of values got out of balance? Oh, I'll make it easy for you. What's the purpose of advertising? My favorite meal is a Diet Coke and a hamburger. I've gone all over this country looking for that beautiful young girl who's going to sing to me, Hold the Lettuce, Hold the Pickles, Special Orders Don't Upset Us. She does not exist. Neither does that hamburger that they show me on television that tries to get me to go crazy and get out of my head and say, I have to have that thing right now. While you go in looking for it, your mind sees it, your mouth is ready for it, and the one you get is the one that got run over by the Mack truck out back, and they've served it now. It's flat. It's no good. What does advertising do? It's supposed to say, forget about reality and look at the dream. Isn't that what sin does? And isn't that what sin had done to this younger man? Amen. You ever gone to buy an automobile and the salesman says something like, as you're taking that test drive and he eases the front wheel off the pavement and you're running along the side and he looks at you and says, boy, doesn't that drive smoothly? How often do you drive your automobile off the side of the road? You see, the younger son couldn't see clearly anymore. And in the words of 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 and 4, the God of this world had blinded his eyes so that the gospel, the truth, could not shine on him. Now, when I see clearly, I have full vision, and I don't overlook anything. Remember what Jesus said? If you're going to get the sawdust out of your brother's eye, you better get the two before out of your eye so that you may see clearly. You remember what happened in the story just prior to the younger son and the older brother? Do you remember this woman who lost the coin? Do you remember she lit a lamp? You ever wonder why she did that? So she could see clearly. You see, sin blinds you. And here's this younger son, blinded by sin, but he's also mad because of sin. And therefore, he cannot see things as they really are. Now, what's the point? National Israel, represented by the scribes and the Pharisees, are mad because of their sin, and they are spiritually blind. Read with me a little bit. If you turn to the 15th chapter of the book of Matthew, and you listen to the 14th verse, listen to what Jesus said. Let them alone, they are blind guys. And if the blind guide the blind, both shall fall into a pit. Go over to Matthew chapter 23, where Jesus deals specifically with these scribes and Pharisees. And look at verses 16 and 17. Woe unto you blind guides that say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing. But whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. Ye fools and blind. Notice what Jesus says about these people. Drop down to verse 19. Ye blind, for which is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifieth the gift? Drop down to verse 24. Ye blind guides that strain out the gnat and swallow the camel. Drop down to verse 26. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first the inside of the cup and of the platter, that the outside thereof may become clean also. How could the scribes and Pharisees have missed the lesson when they saw the younger son mad, blind, asleep in sin? But wait a minute. Christians can be blind in sin. Do you remember what Peter said in 2 Peter 1, 9 when he said, if you don't add those Christian graces in your Christian growth, you are blind? 
not able to see afar off, now here's the clincher, having forgotten the cleansing, King James says purging, the cleansing of your past sins. How many of us sit in assemblies like this and we don't remember the cleansing? You see, what I did there ought to stay with me the rest of my life and ought to mean more to me the next day than it did that day. And it ought to help me to stay out of blindness and madness because of sin. Isn't that the purpose of what's done right there every first day of the week? That's not an exercise in futility. That's a reminder of my past cleansing, that is to keep my eyes open, to keep me awake, to make me keep myself awake so that I don't get blinded by sin. In Revelation 3 and 17, what's the problem at Laodicea? They are blind and need eye salve. It's fun to jump up and down on the younger son. It's even fun to jump up and down on the scribes and Pharisees, but I have to stop and look in the mirror. And that's serious business. And I have to ask myself, am I awake or am I asleep in sin and mad because of sin? Now there's prior to coming to himself. In the second place tonight, I want us to observe the path of coming to himself. Perhaps it is the journey into self that gives most of us the trouble. All of us would probably admit that at some time or another, the journey into sin was fun. Isn't that what the Hebrews writer said? Pleasures of sin? That was fun. And when I am getting out of sin and I'm anticipating going home, the journey home is pleasant. But when the consequences of my sin hit me straight on, it's that journey into myself that gives me the most problem. What did this younger son eventually do? What's involved in coming to himself? If you'll go back with me to the 119th Psalm, I want us tonight to look at verse 59 and get a principle about what is involved when one comes to himself. In verse 59, the psalmist says there are two things that you need to underscore. If you're out here blind in sin and mad because of sin, if you want to come to yourself, here are two things you're going to have to do. In verse 59, first of all, he says, I thought on my ways. Now you see, that means I deeply pondered them. We might say, I turned them upside down. I viewed my conduct on all sides. One writer said that the word here is a metaphor for embroidering. Well, the figure on either side has to be the same, and so when you put the stitch through, you have to turn it over to make sure that it's exactly where it ought to be on both sides. That's the idea of thinking on my ways. And so you see the psalmist considering himself in view, of course, of Jehovah's Word, But while studying the Word, he studied himself. When was the last time we did a really good, in-depth study of self? I preach sermons on the home, and I've seen husbands and wives give the elbow to one another. You see, they were thinking of them, not themselves. I've had people come out the door and they meant well, and I understood what they meant when they said, I really wish my neighbor, my friend, my husband, my wife were here to hear that today. I appreciate that sentiment. But what about you? You were here. Did you hear it? Or did you miss it because you were thinking about somebody else that really needed to hear it? You see, the psalmist said, I thought on my way. Isn't that 2 Corinthians 13, 5? Examine yourselves. Prove your own selves, whether you're in the faith. But then this verse also says, in order to come to oneself, we must turn our feet unto Jehovah's testimony. Now you see, once he thought on his ways, he made a determination. I'm going to make God's word my rule of life, and I'm going to walk by that rule. 
One writer said, He came to the Word, then He came to Himself. And this made Him, that is the psalmist, arise and go to His Father. It happened the same way in the pig pen. And so tonight, if I'm out here in the pig pen of sin, I want to get out. I want to come to myself. I'm going to have to think about my ways. I'm going to have to turn my feet to Jehovah's testimony. And I want to ask you tonight to do something for me. I want you to connect an Old Testament passage and a New Testament passage, and we'll come up with four steps of coming to oneself. I want you to take Psalm 119 and verse 59 and tie it together to 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 10. And you will see what the younger son did, and you will see what I must do, and what you must do, and what any person must do if he's going to get out of being asleep in sin and mad in sin, if he's going to come to himself. Now let's notice the four ways. Psalm 119.59, step number one. I thought on my ways. Isn't that what the younger son did? Step number two, 2 Corinthians 7.10, godly sorrow worked. I don't know how long that boy stayed at home before he left home. I don't know how old he was. But I know it wasn't a priest. It wasn't a prophet. It wasn't a Levite. It wasn't a Jewish official that got him out of that pig pen. It was the memory of what he had seen at home Worked. Godly sorrow worked. Step number three, 2 Corinthians 7.10. Godly sorrow brought about a change of mind. The big jawbreaker word there is repentance. And it means change your mind in context of sin, about living in sin on purpose. Step number four, Psalm 119.59. I turn my feet unto Jehovah's testimony. Now there's the path of coming to oneself. The younger man thought on his, on his ways. What he had learned and what he knew worked. What he thought and what he knew and what he had been taught brought about a change of mind. And when he changed his mind, he turned his feet toward Jehovah's testimonies. That's what brought him home. You see, the thing that made his daddy treat the hired servants like he did was the Word of God. And that's what that boy, by implication, had been taught when he was at home. Let's see it work with the prodigal son of the Old Testament. If you turn back to the 33rd chapter of the book of Second Chronicles, we're introduced to a fellow by the name of Manasseh. And McCartney called Manasseh the prodigal son of the Old Testament. You might want to read the whole 20 verses, or verses 1 to 20 of this chapter in your own study. But for our purpose, I want us to look beginning verse 10 tonight. And Jehovah spake to Manasseh and to his people, but they gave no heed. That sounds like the younger son before he came to himself. Wherefore, Jehovah brought upon them the captains of the host of the king of Assyria, who took Manasseh in chains and bound him with fetters and carried him to Babylon. We might say he's in the pig pen now. And when he was in distress, has anybody discussed or will they discuss the distress of the younger son? He besought Jehovah his God. Did he seek his father? And humbled himself greatly, does that change give me to make me? Before the God of his fathers. And he prayed unto him, and he was entreated of him, and heard his supplication, notice this, and brought him again to Jerusalem, into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that Jehovah, he was God. You take a man by the name of Joseph of Arimathea. In John 19, 38, we learn that he was a disciple. But in Luke 23, verses 50 and 51, he refused to be courageous. He didn't vote to put Jesus to death, but as far as we know, he didn't speak up for him either. In John 19, 38, he's a secret disciple because he's afraid of the Jews. But he thought on his ways. Godly sorrow worked. 
Godly sorrow brought about a change of mind, and he turned his feet toward Jehovah's precepts, and on crucifixion day, according to Mark fifteen forty three, he went in, and here's a key word in that verse, boldly. That's a whole lot different from being a secret disciple because of fear. He went in boldly to Pilate and requested the body of Jesus. You see the same thing with Simon in Acts chapter 8. In verses 5 to 13, he went through these four steps in becoming a Christian. In verses 18 to 24, he went through these four steps in correcting sin. And that applies to everyone in this assembly tonight of accountable age. If you want to get out of sin, you need to think on your ways. You need to let godly sorrow work and let it bring about a change of mind and repentance in your life and turn your feet toward Jehovah's testimonies and gospel obedience to His will. If I'm an unfaithful Christian tonight, I need to think on my ways. I need to let godly sorrow work and let it bring about a change of mind and let me turn my feet toward Jehovah's statutes. National Israel needed to take the journey and come back to God. In Matthew 3, 2, John the Immersing One had told them, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In Matthew 4.17, Jesus had told them, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In Matthew 21.32, Jesus said, When John came and preached, the publicans and the sinners repented, and you Pharisees and scribes wouldn't even let that, the change of their lifestyle, motivate you to obey him. And Matthew 23.37 and 38 says, They never did. The saddest words Judaism ever heard on this earth are found in Matthew 23, 38. Behold, your house is not mine anymore, it is left unto you desolate. Now we've seen him prior to coming to himself, and we've seen the path that brought him to himself. Tonight in the third place, what's the payoff of coming to himself? You see, when he came to himself and was awakened and got back into his right mind, he could see clearly. He realized what all he had done, but here's what he was seeing at that point. He saw that no matter if he had been insistent, no matter if he'd been impatient, no matter if he'd been irrepressible, no matter if he was impoverished, all of that now is going to be in the past. And what he sees is, I need to become immaculate. That's what happens when you turn your feet to Jehovah's testimony. And so when he came to himself, his mind became sound. Now, to be of sound mind is to be so ruled by your mind that you're self-controlled and temperate. Isn't that just opposite of what he had been? When you read Mark 5 and 15, you see a man whom no one could control. And now he's sitting, he's clothed, and he's in his right mind. That's the son when his father sees him. Tonight... Let's look now at the heart of the story. Look at the publicans and sinners who came to themselves contrasted with the Pharisees and scribes who would not. In the 11th chapter of the book of Matthew and in verse 19, Jesus said, The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say... Now, who is they? They say, Behold a gluttonous man and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. Who said that? The scribes and the Pharisees. When you get to the second chapter of the book of Mark, verses 15 and 16, it came to pass that he was sitting at meat in his house, and many publicans and sinners, notice many, sat down with Jesus and his disciples, for they were many, and they followed him, and the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with the sinners and publicans, said unto his disciples, He eateth and drinketh with publicans and sinners? And then you come to Luke 15, verses 1 and 2. And the publicans and sinners were drawing near unto him to hear him. And both the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. Now, how is it going to work in a congregation? 
It may be tonight that some of you in this assembly were fornicators, adulterers, idolaters, effeminate, abusers of yourselves with men, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers. But you thought on your ways. And through the preaching of the gospel, godly sorrow worked. And through the preaching of the gospel, godly sorrow worked repentance. And through the preaching of the gospel, you turned your feet unto Jehovah's testimonies. Now what can we say about you? But ye were washed. But ye were sanctified. But ye were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. Did you notice my favorite word? That coordinating conjunction that indicates a contrast. Do you notice how Paul used it? But, but, that's what you used to be. You came to yourself. And you were washed, sanctified, justified. Now go back to Luke fifteen seventeen, And listen very carefully to what Jesus said. But... When he came to himself. 